Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to DevCon 2015. This conference is about you, Tim Worthington. Tal Sian, this is about you too. And Mike Grimes and Terry Anderson. Today, you and everyone in this room are at an historic moment. We will all very likely witness and without a doubt contribute to an amazing revolution. Together, we will redefine and extend the world as we know it. The idea of reach out and touch somebody is now becoming reach out and touch everything. Cunix and Renaissance have a long history. Our history actually begins when Renaissance was Hitachi. And uh, we've been working, I think, now for over 15 years together. Our relationship and partnership goes way back. And in fact, it predates my founding Micrium in 1999. The original Micros OS was ported to the Hitachi H8 architecture some 20 years ago. We've been supporting all Renaissance CPU architectures ever since. Sega and Renaissance have been cooperating for almost two decades now. Actually, the first version of a real-time operating system has been written for an NEC 8-bit um, processor, the 78K0. Since then, we've ported um, the operating system and all of the other software products to virtually all Renaissance processors. Greenhills has been supporting the family of Renaissance products for close to 25 years starting with our, our compiler and debugger technologies for, at the time, NEC, uh, Hitachi, and Mitsubishi, and then uh, recently adding in our, our safety and security solutions based on our operating systems and virtualization capabilities for our car. Uh, we worked originally with the H8, we worked with a lot of SHs, um, the NEC 850, we've worked with just about everything uh, in terms of Renaissance parts. Over the years, um, you know, we've had a lot of mutual customers, We've developed relationships with the Renaissance personnel, and so we've worked on a lot of customer opportunities. We at our systems, we had a relationship with Renaissance for more than 25 years. Of course, we have a very strong and close relationship. But in recent years, through the transition of Renaissance, we have seen the strength of Renaissance, we have seen the installed base, and I would say that the loyalty of customers is of course a differentiator in the industry. Today's embedded world holds endless possibilities. We have entered the era of platforms and the true realization of end-to-end -end solutions. The R-Car platform is very central to our strategy for the Cunix Car infotainment platform. And we're trying to have faster time to market by working with chipsets that scale uh, from low to high and to have a set of software that is modular. We pre-integrate everything into Cunix Car with the goal of allowing the Tier 1 or the OEM to innovate on the features that will make their customers be compelled to buy their vehicles. Uh, by doing this, we allow very fast turnaround and we're trying to shorten the development cycle. So Renaissance turned to us for advice on how to make the RX more RTOS friendly when the RX was still on the drawing board. We requested the inclusion of some 20 or so features we're proud to say that many of which were actually implemented in the RX. The Renaissance and Sega brands are actually quite similar. It's uh, a bit surprising given the fact that Renaissance is a huge company and Sega is uh, much smaller, but we're both global companies providing sophisticated, reliable solutions that are easy to use. The products simply work. Some of the challenges that Renaissance and Green Hills are, are seeing in our customer engagements are around the growing complexity around system design as it approaches 300 million lines of code in a vehicle and the need to both have safety and security designed into the platform. Express Logic is very proud to be part of the Renaissance Alliance Partner Program at a platinum level. Uh, the Partner Program is very much like the RZ Express, at least at a very high level. It basically means that we are going to have really good integration communication with Renaissance and that means that our customers, our mutual customers, will benefit from it. We listen to our customers. Uh, we know today that many of our customers are concerned about code quality and control of code quality. 
So recent years, we have actually added runtime analysis and static analysis to our product on top of the functional safety we're offering we have. And we have actually several products for the Renaissance portfolio as functional safety. It also represents a necessary shift in the embedded industry. A change coming from increased connectivity and as always, a drive for return on investment and shorter time to market. We want to be part of this journey and we want to be active. And I have a personal commitment to be part of the transition of the embedded industry. So, Tim, Tao, Mike, Terry, this is your palette. Have your way with it. Dream big. Do your magic. And know that the world for generations to come will be an amazing place. This is your moment to accelerate, innovate, and differentiate. Renaissance welcomes you. Good morning. Let me begin. On behalf of the Global Renaissance Organization, I'd like to thank our esteemed partners, QNX, Micrium, ExpressLogic, Greenhills, Sager, and IAR, for working with us for over two decades so that we can innovate and deliver the type of solutions you have come to expect from us. Thank you very much. <laughs> My name is Ali Sept, and I'm your host for this DEF CON 2015. We make elegant machines all over the map, and these elegant machines are now forecasted to explode exponentially. In fact, there are numbers all over the map, but it isn't the, in the numbers that's as important as the journey. Some are forecasting 50 billion, but we'd like to talk more conservative numbers, 25 billion in five short years. And by the way, before I begin, I would like to share some pain with you. When phones got connected, they called them smartphones. Now that our machines are going to be connected, they call them things. It's kind of uh, disrespectful. I wish they had called them smart machines. At any rate, 25 billion is the conservative number, and it's not the number that's so important. Rather, what value can we extract from this, and how can we monetize this value? We need to scale rapidly. Um, you know, if, the, if it's 5 billion or so today, going to 25 billion requires a lot of scalability. The challenge we have is that today, most of our businesses are using the pipeline model, meaning our scalability and our growth is directly dependent on the demand that's put on our products. We buy raw material, we make them, we store them, we ship them to distribution, and the only way we can increase our sales is if our end customers increase their demand on us. There is really no other way for us to scale exponentially. What we need to do is adopt platforms. We have entered the era of platforms. Of course, very quickly, I'll share with you this successful example of smartphones. And smartphones have three vectors that have made them successful. First, they have access to a rich set of uh, internal assets, such as strong processors, extensive memory, and adequate power, the connectivity to the cloud, and the most important element of their success comes from the fact that there is an army of developers that are developing value for this platform. And I'm going to get back to this, because had, had it not been for the enablement of these app developers to develop these apps, the smartphone platform could not scale the way it has. And the other key thing to remember is that this platform has abstracted in the, 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 the technical elements of the platform in such a way that many of these app developers are actually not technical, but they have a very strong business acumen. They understand how to establish services and monetize the information that the platform generates. So first we begin with data. 
our machines and this platform generate or collect data. The data is displayed in the form of information. And by the way, that's where our machines stop. Our beautiful, elegant, embedded machines take data and display it in, in the form of information or transfer the information to another machine that makes decision. In the smart for arena, what these app developers are doing is taking one step further, and that is to take the information and establish intelligence. It's the intelligence that derives value, and you can monetize the intelligence. So the real challenge is how do we take our machines and enable developers, whether it's app developers, our own developers, our ecosystem developers, to take the information that our machines generate and take it that next step further. Let's look at two consumer examples. This is a doorbell, a video-based doorbell. It's a commercial product. It's an elegant product. What it does is it trans transfers, transmits the data, which is the video signal, to you remotely. You could be sitting at your office. You look at your iPhone. A service person rings the bell, and, and you want to see if they're authorized to enter, so you remotely open the door. What this machine has done is essentially taken the video data and translated it to information. Let's look at another video camera, Dropcam. What they have done is they take the data, which is the video feed, they transfer it in the form of information into the cloud, and they have these analytics in the cloud that learn over time the behavior in your house. So if every week, Monday through Friday, you open the refrigerator door between 8 and 9 a.m., it becomes a learned behavior. And if somehow one day that refrigerator door gets open at 11 a.m., that's an irregular behavior. So there is an event triggered, you get a text, and that's where the intelligence is derived from. Of course, they also use the cloud to store your video feed. So they're taking information and adding intelligence to it, and this is why they can charge for it. If you want a rolling seven-day package of stored information analytics, you pay $10. And if you want a rolling 30-day package of stored information analytics, you pay $30. So you see the difference between the previous model and this model. Closer to home for us, pumps in our deep embedded world, pumps are a critical component of factories. If pumps go down, pumps uh, pump water to cool down our machines, they pump oil to lubricate our machines. If a pump goes down in a factory, it has economic effects. The data related to the pump is the electrical parameters that make the pump work. Over time, as we overload the pump, the pump fails, and we collect that information, and that becomes the information piece, meaning we know under what conditions the pump fails. Now, if we can take it to the next stage and predict when the pump is going to fail, that's the intelligence. That can be monetized. If we can inform a factory, next week your pump is going down, we better repair it, that's intelligence, and we can monetize it. So we have to think beyond what we have done normally, which is taking data and showing information. The challenge for us is that we make these elegant machines. And what I mean by elegance is that we pick the most efficient microcontroller, the least amount of memory, because we don't want to waste. We have fixed function machines. Hence, we cannot transfer to the intelligence piece. What the promise of IoT is that by connecting to the cloud, we now have access to unlimited processing power, unlimited memory, and unlimited power. So if we can take our machine's information, send it to the cloud, then that's where the next step can occur from information to intelligence. And that's the opportunity for us to bring in these apps developers. It could be someone who has no technical background but a great business acumen, an understanding of how they can take information and extract value from it so we can monetize it. To do this, we need connectivity. Our machines, generally speaking, are insular machines. We use a scheduler. We don't use real-time operating systems. Once you want to have connectivity, 
you now need a real-time operating system, a commercial real-time. You need communication stacks. You need file systems. All of a sudden, the complexity of our machines goes from something we have known very well to something where, generally speaking, has not been our domain of expertise. We might not have the engineering resources, the financial resources, or the time to make this transition. So adoption of platforms is the opportunity for us to bypass that step. A platform must have three core elements. First, there are many platforms, by the way, out there. A platform must be flexible. Unlike the smartphone, where the hardware is a fixed function element, our products run the gamut from tractors to refrigerators to health good devices and to deep industrial automation. So a, flex a platform must be flexible. It must accentuate a core competency. Not anybody can get into the game. And it must enable other value providers to join the ecosystem. So you see, with those elements, the question is, as we want to traverse from our fixed function machines into the cloud, into this intelligence layer, do we really want to build a bridge or use someone else's bridge? And of course, we have to pay a toll. It's not free. Nevertheless, the amount of energy required to build that bridge is really not worth our time. What we want to do is get into our core competency. This past June, we announced the Renaissance Synergy platform in its technology form. And at this conference, we're announcing the elements of the Renaissance Synergy platform. There are five elements associated with our platform. First and foremost, it's a software-rich platform. In fact, we architected the software first and then decided how to design the hardware. These five elements are made of the, uh, Syner the Synergy software itself, the Synergy software platform, the, a new series of microcontrollers, Synergy tools and kits, Synergy solutions, and the Synergy gallery. I'll spend a little time in each one of these elements. First, the software. Underneath the software package, there is a real-time operating system along with frameworks, application frameworks, and functional libraries. And all of this is enabled to you or brought to you with a new API layer. On the IDE side, we're using Eclipse and our partner IAR just made a press release. They have been working to develop a new environment in their IDE tool chain to support this new platform. In the solutions, in the kits, we have complete kits that show you the entire journey from concept to end product, how we use the API, how we use uh, the application frameworks, what trade-off analysis did we do, in addition to the traditional Gerber files and schematics and bill of materials. And the gallery, which was the fifth element of the platform, is where we store the software you can download and remotely license the Synergy software uh, platform. And you have visibility to all the VSA partners. So all the VSA partners who develop software for the Synergy platform, it's visible to you in our gallery. We have abstracted elements of embedded machines that don't necessarily differentiate your product, meaning if you were to design a human machine interface, a connectivity or security, that's the bridge, that's the infrastructure you need to build. What you want to get to is to, to get onto the other side of the bridge. So we have licensed ExpressLogic's real-time operating system, we have licensed ExpressLogic's stacks, communication stacks, file system, and graphic stacks. Next to it, we have built these application frameworks. So far we have 13, and it's an ever-growing organic list of application frameworks that we will continue to build. Today what we have are audio, graphics, security, communications, the fundamental application frameworks that make up our systems. And then we have the functional libraries, like crypt crypto libraries, um, DSP libraries, um, communication libraries, security libraries. Underneath that, 
we have abstracted the hardware with a hardware abstraction layer, and then there's a board support package that support this. All of this is meshed together elegantly. You can just go at the API layer, simply pick, I want this type of interface, these parameters, and the system does the rest for you. It generates the code for you. Next to it is our QSA, Qualified Software Add-ons. This is where we will develop specialty software for vertical segments, whether it's um, for medical, for building automation. And then next to it is what we call the VSA, the Verified Software Add-ons. This is where we enable you or anybody to develop your software and bring it into this package, bring it into the Synergy software package. We say verified software add-ons because we verify it. We ensure that it works and it's compatible with the API. We ensure it doesn't break the API. And as we do updates and upgrades to our Synergy software package, we ensure compatibility to your verified software add-on package. The Synergy microcontrollers. Oh, before I get that, I just want to say one more thing. Flexibility. I mentioned a platform. One of its core elements must be flexible. The Synergy software platform enables you to have access to the APIs or have access to the drivers, to the abstracted drivers, have access directly to the registers, so if you have a machine that has motor control as well as HMI, on the HMI layer, you can use the abstracted ability or connection, such as the APIs. But on the motor control, you need real-time access. So you can have direct access to the MCU to invoke and enable the real-timeness of the motor control. So it's a flexible platform. It allows you to interface with all the layers of the software and the hardware. I mentioned platforms must accentuate a core competency. And we developed the, this new series of microcontrollers after we architected the software package. <clears throat> the software package, or the uh, Renaissance Synergy microcontrollers, there are four series, S1 through S7, from ultra low power to very high performance. And what we did, in developing the series is we retained and established compatibility and scalability. And what this means, this means that we developed orthogonal registers. You see, most of us build machines that have a low-end series, a mid-range series, and a high-end series. The control function, the basic control function generally doesn't change from the low end to the mid-range to the high end. What changes are our addition of HMI, addition of connectivity, security, and maybe more IOs. I want to take you through a journey, an example of a thermostat. A low end thermostat in this case would just have LED connectivity. You would use a, set of, a certain set of APIs to generate what's required to communicate with the MCU to uh, have the functionality required, the set of APIs will program your registers. And of course, in this case, you'd use the S1 series. Now you want to go to your mid-range. Watch what happens. As you go to the mid-range, you use more APIs. In this case, with the mid-range, you want to use a segment uh, LCD display. So you use more APIs so that you can achieve the segment LCD display functionality. The previous registers and the bits on those registers are retained. You add to it the new registers required for the LCD segment display. And as you noticed, as you went from the S1 series to the S3 series, the pins, the physical location of the pins is retained in the same uh, uh, physical vicinity. So you don't have to relay out your board for power and ground pins or, or the analog pins or the digital. So that's where we say compatibility and scalability. Let's take this one step further. Now you want to have a high-end machine and you want to have a graphics display and security. You add more APIs, so you use or invoke more APIs. The previous registers are retained. You use more registers to establish the graphics 
and the connectivity. You go from the S3 series to the S7 series, and if you noticed, we kept the pins in the same physical location. Orthogonality means you, can, you write your software once and you can use it multiple times. The whole idea, if you have these three series of products, the effort to write the software shouldn't be 3x. It should be 1.x, 1.2, 1.3x. And that's the promise of the platform concept and the Renaissance Synergy platform. Safety and security is another element that we focused on. Of course, there are many other elements that I don't have time to get into. In fact, as you attend the classes, all these details will be shared with you. But in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the scalability and compatibility, as well as safety and security. You develop your machine. You write the software. It's fantastic. Then you go to the contract manufacturer to start your production. You give the contract manufacturer your encrypted file, and you give them the key to decrypt it, decrypt it so they can program the MCU. Think about it. You've encrypted it to protect against IP theft as well as malicious use of your IP. IP theft means cloning or overproduction, and malicious intent means using your IP for something that you're not intending to do. And then, so you encrypt it, you give it to the client, and then you give them the key and say, here, go decrypt it and program my MCU. Kind of odd. And of course, some of us don't even encrypt our files. Here's what we're going to do. What we're going to say is you encrypt your file, give it to the contract manufacturer, but don't give them the key. Retain the key in a secure location. When the contract manufacturer puts the MCU in the programmer and hits the initial initialization, the first thing that happens is that a true random number generator is invoked. And the keys are generated inside the MCU. This first layer of keys are used to establish a secure connection with your key. Remember I said you just give them your encrypted file and retain your file key in a secure location. The MCU has used a true random num number generator to generate a key. Then the MCU will use a hardware encryption engine to encapsulate this key. This key is now encapsulated. It's locked, and the public key is given out through a secure connection that the MCU will establish through the programmer to where you have hidden the file key. That file key is then brought into the MCU. The key inside the MCU is hidden using a hardware protection unit. By the way, we I'm not showing you the hardware protection unit, otherwise you'd know where the key is. <clears throat> so, you use this key to establish a secure connection where, where the real key is hidden or the file key is hidden. You bring it into the MCU or the MCU does this. And then, the MCU will bring in the encrypted file into the RAM location, use the file key to decrypt it, and program the flash. No humans touch this. This is an innovation that no other MCU supplier has in the market today. And this is what we mean by innovation in terms of security. And this technology is available in all our Renaissance series. And our partners have used this, our VSA partners have used this engine to develop VSA software for firewalls, SSLs, and other forms of security software that is added to the Synergy software platform. What all of this means is that traditionally, when you develop your embedded machines, you start with the hardware, you do the drivers, you do the middleware integration, communication stacks, file system, you integrate it with the RTOS, and then you go to the cloud connectivity. All of this, what we're saying is don't waste your time on it. 
this is something that the Synergy platform can do. We know our registers best. We know our hardware best. Let the Synergy platform do this system work for you. You focus on your application code, and with the time you have, focus more on, on more additional innovation, hence enabling differentiation. We're also committed to a very rich portfolio. So in addition to the Synergy software platform, the RL, the RX, the RZ, our microcontrollers and microprocessors that you have come to love are still here. In fact, many of our lectures and labs are DEF CON, are in support of these uh, microcontroller and microprocessor devices. So now you've built your system. You have the connectivity. Now you say, I'm in the cloud. You know, we're not cloud engineers. You know, we're embedded machine engineers. We build fine, elegant machines. You're now in the cloud. I mean, how do you program in the cloud? What do you do in the cloud? And remember, the whole reason to get into the cloud is so we can have access to developers who can take information and turn it into intelligence. We have partnered, we have announced two press releases at this conference with people who have expert platforms in the cloud. The first one I'll talk about is Zebra. Zebra is one of the leaders in building barcode scanners, barcode printers, RFID solutions. In fact, if you invoke an e-commerce transaction, chances are it's a Zebra barcode printer that printed the barcode, puts it on the box at some warehouse where they're gonna ship the box to you. There's a scanner that scans it. The delivery, UPS, FedEx, whoever's gonna deliver the box, chances are they're using a Zebra solution to scan and deliver it to you. You know, these guys have decades of experience in logistics. What they did, is they said, let's develop a cloud platform so when customers bring their information to the cloud, they shouldn't be making, they should just, it's the make versus buy decision. Enable them, empower them with a cloud IoT platform so that they can do the intelligence piece in the cloud. So they have your basic enterprise applications such as dashboard, reporting, event processing, rules engine, data storage, analytics, and then they've wrapped it with a device API and an application API. The whole idea is for multiple heterogeneous applications to work with multiple heterogeneous devices. That happens in their platform, which is called the Zatar platform. Now, how does it work? They have a brilliant approach. They create an avatar of your machine in the cloud. So this is a refrigerated truck delivering perishable goods each one of the boxes in there has its own avatar in the cloud. Applications can be written to deal with those, such as are these per perishable good boxes, is the health of the boxes, the temperature maintained? Were they delivered on time to the location? When they were delivered to the location, the ownership changes from the supplier to the purchaser. Pricing algorithms, all of these things can happen in the cloud and visible, accessible to you in mobile platforms. What I'd like to do is take a minute and ask or share with you a video from Anders Gustafsson, the CEO of Zebra, and his perspectives. Zebra was founded some 46 years ago by two, uh, uh, two founders, Ed Kaplan and Gary Kless, and in mid-80s got into barcode printing, which has been the core of the company for most of its life. You know, we've expanded our portfolio, became the strong market leader in uh, specialty printing in, in all sorts of markets, but also to active RFID, passive RFID, and most recently with the acquisition of Motorola's enterprise business. So now we serve basically 95% um, of the global Fortune 500 companies, uh, retail, manufacturing, transportation logistics, healthcare. We help our customers connect the physical world to the digital world. We scan a barcode, you, that asset you know, has now communicated something about itself to, to an application. So the physical world has been able to communicate to the digital world. And out of that, we, the first big project we came up with was Satar, our IoT-based cloud platform. Our vision was that there will be this uh, proliferation of connected devices. Zebra and Renesas has worked together for, for many, many years. We've had Renesas microcontrollers in virtually all of our printers and our relationship has been very, very tight, I'd say, for a long time. And now I think we see then new, new opportunities. 
as Renesis has uh, you know, st such a strong presence in microcontrollers and in, in, in being able to you know, provide intelligence to all sorts of disparate devices around uh, our, our customers, our mutual customers' premises, and partner that with, with uh, Satar. So I think that the Renesis uh, Synergy platform is an ideal framework for uh, enabling all sorts of devices to be connected to the internet. And when you, com you know, combine that also with uh, our Satar platform, you know, we can offer uh, the base functionality to our end user customers so that they don't have to develop that themselves. They can focus instead on uh, developing the functionality that really differentiates their products or services. As a fellow engineer, I gotta say, I think the Internet of Things is, is probably the most exciting new development that's happened in, in, in the last decade. You know, it's rare that we get a chance to work on developing new technology that can really have such a huge impact on, on business and society at large. Thank you, Anders. As I mentioned, two partnerships directly between the Synergy platform and these cloud platform partners, direct uh, uh, connection. The second one is Verizon. We have worked with Verizon to establish this direct link between our platform and their cloud solution. You know, Verizon is not new to the game. They have been doing this for years. What they have done is package their strength, their core competency of these enterprise applications into a very easy to use package by providing APIs so that you can take advantage of all the strengths they have. First, through an intermediate partner called Bug Labs, any sensor information that's in the platform can come into the cloud and you can have these widgets that demonstrate and show uh, all the status of the sensors and the physical world. You can pick and choose these widgets. You can set trigger points. And then you can come directly into their analytics, storage, rules engines, event processing. So all the core competencies that they have will be available to you through an API layer. What differentiates the Verizon platform are things like security, the ability to prevent intrusion. You can kill a session if unauthorized access is happening to your machine. And quality of service is very important. Imagine you are building a medical machine, a medical device that goes into an ambulance. Naturally, in this case, you'll have a cellular connection to the cloud. You want to guarantee the data path the key KPIs that go from your medical machine into the application in the cloud and back. Using the API, you can establish a quality of service connection. In other words, the traffic that goes between your machine and the cloud and back, you can control that. You can gain advantage over other devices that have the same connection, cellular connection, because this is a life-threatening machine. And you can do so, you can gain that type of control over the traffic through the simple API. I'd like to share with you a video from Marnie Walden, the EVPN president of product and new business innovation at Verizon. We opened our first innovation center in Waltham, Massachusetts, and the whole idea was to bring all kinds of partners into the innovation center to work side by side with them to working on getting LTE modules into devices. And it was not just about a smartphone or a tablet, it was garbage cans, it was watches, it was um, digital signage. And now you're starting to see those solutions deployed um, really within use cases, which is really exciting. So on the East Coast, we're doing doing a lot of work around smart cities. So if you're on the East Coast and you're a municipality, what you worry about is traffic congestion and trying to find ways to uh, improve that. So providing things like signaling, smart signaling, or smart parking solutions where you can reroute uh, the cars so that it goes down a different route or finding available parking, all of those kinds of things are really important. Now if you're on the West Coast, what's really interesting is you're very much worried about uh, the water. And so providing smart agriculture 
multicultural solutions is really critical. So at Verizon, we realize that we won't be able to do this by ourselves. So having key partners who can come in and collaborate together is really critical to delivering these use cases and improving the places that we live and work. Partnership and collaboration is really important. So bringing the Renaissance Synergy platform together with Verizon's IoT solutions allows us to get to market very quickly. If we were doing this by ourselves, I think we would both have to go and invest in a bunch of R&D. Our time to market would be late. So having a great partner like this is really critical to us getting to market, providing solutions, and then also coming up with new business models together uh, to really advance this. Thank you, Marnie. And next is the ultimate platform. And I say ultimate because, excuse me. We in the United States, according to the US Census Bureau, in five short years by 2020, will have close to 40 million citizens age of 70 or over. In addition to that, According to the Trans, uh, tra Traffic Admi uh, Transport Administration, only 4% of our citizens age 70 or over are using the public transport system. This means we have an aging society and we don't have a good public transport system. We have two options. The first is to move to Europe or Japan where they have an excellent public transport system or to build autonomous cars. The other side of this coin is crash proofing. <clears throat> Over a decade ago, as an industry, we developed ABS and airbags and EPS, tire pressure monitor systems, and all sorts of passive safety solutions that lowered deaths. However, in the past five years, the deaths have been steady at 100 per day. And according to the NHTSA, 95% of these accidents are the result of human errors. So we have to automate our cars and make them safe. So that's why I call it the ultimate platform. <clears throat> so if we're going to automate our cars, that means we are no longer going to drive. So we have to replace our eyes and our feeling and our sense for the road with these sensors. These sensors are cameras, radars, lidars, and V2X radios. Collectively, they represent us. Collectively, they displace us. They displace how we see and feel the road. The good news is that the capability of these sensors is improving, and there is a healthy price erosion that's happening with these sensors. Now, how do we use these sensors to automate our cars? <clears throat> these sensors, the feed from these sensors, the information, the data from these sensors is fed into these very powerful compute engines that are powered by Renaissance R cars and in the future RH850s. These are very powerful processors that are doing functional safety, security, and communication. In addition to these core processors, what we announced at this DEF CON is a new R car T2, which is a device that sits right next to the camera, takes the analog video feed, and digitizes it, and transmits Ethernet AVB signals to any modules in the car. We also announced a RCAR WTR, which is a DSRC V2X radio. So essentially, it's a radio for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure communications. So the combination of these compute engines and these new chips will bring the sense or the information from the road into the car. We have partnered with Harbrick. They have this elegant platform called PolySync. Essentially, their platform abstracts the sensor world from what we want to do, which is the intelligence piece. How do we take all of this sense and generate intelligence? They have developed a very rich and easy to use set of APIs so that we can focus on object detection and classification. Is this a human? Is it a tree? Is it an ambulance? Is it a fire truck? Is it a car? 
as well as obstacle avoidance and path planning. You see, everything up to this stage is building the bridge. Do you want to build this bridge? Do you want to invest your money in building this very complex set of platforms? Or do you want to focus on what we really need, which is this intelligence piece? You see, up until now, only a few rich companies have been able to do this. This partnership, our strong compute engines and processors, as well as Harbix platforms, in a sense democratizes. It enables anybody, just as I mentioned in the apps world, who are people who aren't knowledgeable with the machine, but have a good business acumen. In this world, scientists or others who have intelligent understanding of artificial intelligence, fuzzy logic, can add value to this ultimate platform without having billions of dollars to build the platform. That's the name of the game and that's what we're enabling. We have two cars that demonstrate this capability at this DEF CON and we're giving rides outside in the parking lot showing uh, sensor fusion, V2X communication, as well as uh, a full surround view. Of course, the other layer of autonomous uh, driving is the command and control. In the command and control, you know, you need to have in-vehicle health. You see, we're no longer driving the car. We don't have that tactile feedback to sense whether or not the car is going to break down to take it in for repair. So you need this in-vehicle in -vehicle health module that can sense and realize, oh my God, the car is going to fail. We need to take it in for repair. Of course, there's V2X communication with the cloud or other vehicles and infrastructure. There's occupant monitoring and, of course, over-the-air programming. All of this combined goes into the steering control, the brake control, the engine control, and then that's when the actuation happens. At this point, I'd like to invite you to see a brief video from Joshua Harting, the CEO of Harbrick. Harbor came out of a company called Autonomous Stuff, where I was CTO. I was brought in to build out kind of an automotive engineering component of that group, which was otherwise just selling kind of the hardware components, the sensors, the computers that you need to build autonomous vehicles. What happened was I ended up on site with a variety of customers, not only in automotive, but in mining, military, agriculture, academia, customers that were the most advanced teams in the world building out autonomous vehicles. And what I saw was there was a common problem among all of them, which is that they were all building the entire software stack themselves. And we were estimating that somewhere on the order of 60 to 70 percent of the effort or of the funding that they were putting into these systems was going into building out kind of the back-end infrastructure and troubleshooting that. And what we're seeing on the road now with the Google car and with Uber and Apple and all the OEMs, these tend to be more prototypes or demonstrators. Our PolySync product in combination with Renesis R car technology, is really the first step toward a fully productionized solution to solve some of those problems. But there's also challenges simply in the component tool chain and the way that we develop these systems in the first place. Renesis and Harbrick are working together to build out a full productionized tool chain for building out automated vehicle algorithms and then testing and validating them all the way through to mass deployment and then managing the life cycle of the vehicle. We're having much higher bandwidth of sensing coming in for autonomous vehicle driving. Typically we're seeing on the order of one to two gigabits per second of data. And that's something like 10x what you see on a vehicle today. We also have the need for high-end, high-performance, really exotic software algorithms to process all this data to tell the car where to go and, and how to drive there. We've got eight high-density LIDARs, we've got five radars, and we've got three cameras running simultaneously on these cars. This is a massive data load, and our car is handling it perfectly. So we're really highlighting sensor fusion, which is kind of the basis of advanced autonomous vehicle algorithms. 
Polysync is a platform that makes it easier and faster to build out automated driving applications. These are things like auto emergency braking, lane keeping, blind spot monitoring. We've worked with a lot of the players in the industry, and we're partnered with Renesis because we think that they have a singular drive and vision toward a future of automated driving. Renesis has more experience than anybody else in functional safety. They understand the challenges that it will take to deploy safe and reliable systems into the field. I'm really excited about the work that we've done with Renesis in building these two Cadillacs for DevCon. They're a big step in showing the power of Renesis' RCAR platform and Harbrick's PolySync platform in easing the development of autonomous vehicle algorithms. Thank you, Joshua. And Joshua is here with us. So, this is our fourth DEF CON. And when we established our first DEF CON, we had three guiding principles. No fluff, focus on solutions, and our concierge customer service, where we ensure that while you're here, your experience is meaningful to you. On behalf of my staff and the entire global Renaissance organization, I hope that we meet and even exceed your expectations. Thank you very much.